Now let's turn our attention to installing MySQL within Windows. So we'll label this section Windows Installation slash Support. Now MySQL has long supported the Windows environment. It provides support for both Windows 32 and 64-bit platforms, which include all versions of Windows since Windows 2000 for both bit editions, which includes 2000, 2003, 2008 on the server side and on the desktop side XP Vista Windows 7. So XP Vista and 7. These are all versions that are available in both 32-bit and 64-bit editions. So MySQL runs on both and as a consequence when you set up MySQL it runs like it does on the Unix side as a service which means it runs in the background. So backgrounded like a daemon which means it runs behind the scenes and performs as it would in the Nix base environment. Now it's available via multiple download packages so available via the following packages and of course this is subject to change but currently these are the packages that are available. The essentials package this is a minimum server build sans documentation the instance manager which allows you to manage one or more instances of MySQL on the same server so for example if you're an ISP one ideal way to host MySQL distinctly is via multiple instances yet another way is to use virtualization technologies but you could dedicate distinct in instances of MySQL with distinct data directories per client if necessary using the instance manager but the essentials package does not include the instance manager neither does it include the embedded server which is used to embed MySQL into your applications nor does it include the benchmark suite so quite a bit is left out if you need just a vanilla installation of MySQL however essentials works for many scenarios so depending on your needs will determine if you'll download the essentials versus the complete package which is the other offering or one of the other offerings so the complete package includes everything in the essentials which is the bare bones MySQL server and client utilities plus all packages which includes everything that's not included in the essentials package documentation instance manager embedded server and the benchmark suite so we should just note that the essentials package includes a minimum server which really amounts to MySQL D and MySQL client utilities sans the other items so if you need again just a server and the client utilities download the essentials package which is considerably smaller than the complete package both essentials and complete packages are available as MSI installer packages and yet the other way that MySQL can be downloaded is via the no install archive so this package includes pretty much everything minus the configuration wizard which helps you to set up your MySQL default configuration so this is a method of implementing MySQL that's similar to the source build where you have the top level directory container within a zip file and beneath it you're free to customize if you're familiar with the MySQL environment MySQL to your desired spec so it's basically a zip archive and it doesn't include the configuration wizard and MySQL may be downloaded as source files so let's just note as well source files which of course require compilation 
which means you'll need to have a compiler on your Windows box, perhaps within a SIGWIN environment that can compile the C files to binary files so that you may set them up, install them, and so on. Of course, with the source files in a no-install archive, you have to do a lot of things manually, such as setting up the service, configuring the my.cnf, my.ini, default config files, setting registry keys, and a number of other items, which is why it's suggested, of course, that you download either the essentials or complete package. We've opted to download the complete package. Now, installation, which will be our first task that we cover in this section, is done rather straightforwardly by navigating to the dev.mysql website slash downloads and selecting the package for your platform. The website tends to auto detect the connecting user agent from the user agent variable supplied by your web browser which includes the operating system. So that's where we've downloaded the package from. A part of installation that's important is that you define a user, a MySQL user, that has admin level privileges. So we'll create a MySQL account with admin rights. And since our Windows 2008 server is functioning as an Active Directory server, we'll make the user a domain administrator, which will allow the user administrative rights on any of the member servers and other Active Directory servers with our environment, within our environment in the event that we decide to install MySQL on multiple other systems. So you need to create a MySQL account. Unlike, this stands in stark contrast to the Unix Linux model whereby the MySQL account is a non-privileged account. So let's just note, in stark contrast to the Linux Unix model, the MySQL account requires full rights. However, within Nix environments, the user is a standard non-privileged account. Important distinction, of course, which inherently makes the Nix-based implementation more secure. So you're relying upon the Windows security to protect the administrative profile of your MySQL account. So just something to keep in mind, but it is a requirement because otherwise MySQL may fail to run correctly. Another note that we should point out is that you should disable, and this is also a suggestion from MySQL's developers, antivirus scanning. Not entirely, of course, of the data directory which is defined in the MySQL config file and temporary directory which is used by MySQL. We should dedicate a distinct, so dedicate distinct temp dir in the my.ini configuration file and ensure that the antivirus software doesn't scan this temp directory as well as the data directory. Otherwise, the antivirus software may suspect that MySQL's behavior is suspicious and either shut it down or inhibit access or slow access to the files that are managed by MySQL. So with that said, we know what our marching orders are. We need to ensure that the package is downloaded. We've downloaded the complete package MSI. We need to ensure that antivirus is either disabled or will ignore the data and temp directories. And we need to set the account up, MySQL, with domain admin privileges. And we also need to install the application. So we're going to connect to our Windows 2008 server. So let's open a shell. And we don't need to be root, so we'll drop from that remote system. Let's reset the buffer. Let's execute a history grep our desk to see if anything's in our history that's useful. We want to connect as the administrator. 
So none of these IP addresses look useful, but the settings look pretty useful. And that's because that's the the last the last few invocations that we've run were not ideal for connecting to this particular server. Now it doesn't appear that we have our desktop installed on this SUSE box. So what we'll do is SSH into another system that has it installed, our Red Hat Enterprise box. So as we try to tab out our desktop, notice that it fails. So let's SSH as root. And a good thing to turn on is the X host plus to ensure that X is able to write or X based applications are able to write back to our local screen. We'll then turn on X11 forwarding and connect as root to the remote system or as a non privileged user. Either or will work. Optionally, we could find the TS client or the R desktop RPM for SUSE Enterprise 11 and install it and use it as opposed to using it from a remote system. But since this is Linux, we can run programs from a remote system and have their display render on our local system. So let's launch in our desktop. We should have something in our history. Let's do a history grep our desk to see what's there. And we have one that goes full screen. So let's go with 999. And notice that pops up. Full screen, it appears as if it's running locally when it's really displaying locally. So we'll be performing the installation as the user administrator. And we'll also create the MySQL account as the administrative user. So let's authenticate as administrator. And this will log us in momentarily once we've indicated the appropriate password. And it's actually trying to log on to the local domain, which is the problem. So let's indicate administrator at ad.linuxcbt.internal which is the Active Directory domain as opposed to the local user accounts database. And now we have a session on the remote system. It auto pulls up an on-screen keyboard because the box is a headless box. It doesn't have an attached keyboard nor mouse. So no standard in default is available. So with that said, we need to check our downloads from Firefox, which downloads into the user's home directory downloads, where we'll find the MySQL download that we pulled down earlier today. So in the interest of saving time, since it's about 100 megabytes, we pulled it down. This is the MSI package, the Windows installer package that's available from the website. Now let's just pull up the website just so you can see at least currently where the package is available. Navigating to, let's select all here, dev.mysql.com slash downloads, which we hit earlier. And we're interested in the community server, latest version 5145. We click on download, and their site should be able to parse from the user agent that we're connecting from Windows, which is why it defaults to Windows. But there are other platforms that are available. The common Unix and Linux platforms are available. So once you're within the Windows world, and you scroll down a bit, which is what we'll do here, you'll see the various packages that we've discussed. Here's the essential package. This, as we've mentioned, contains just enough to get you the client utilities and the server. No documentation, no instance manager, and some of the other key items are not installed. And we see it for the 64-bit as well as 32-bit environments, roughly about 40 megs each. Then we see the full installer for 32-bit and 64-bit environments. They're about 105 megs, roughly 100 megs. Then we see the full version, the archive version, that's binary, but requires a lot of configuration. And then here's the no installer. It doesn't include an installer. And each item contains MD5 sums, which can be confirmed if on Windows you need to confirm your MD5 sums, use a program like JSummer or any compatible program to confirm. So we pulled the 32-bit version of the full package, so no need for us to repull it. We simply need to set it up. However, we've yet to define in Active Directory the MySQL account. So let's navigate to the administrative tools and then pull up our Active Directory users and computers and define this domain administrative user with a tight enough password that will make the environment happy. So we'll dedicate a new account just to this particular usage and it'll be able to be accessed across the wire. 
So we'll just label the user MySQL with the same account name. And that user will be created as domain name backslash or user at FQDN. Let's define a password. And we'll indicate that since it's a service account, that the password should never expire. And the account must be enabled in order for the service to start. And now we have an account, MySQL. So now we're ready to install the package. Let's launch it. And like most Windows programs, installation is rather straightforward. There are a few ways or a few methods that are available, which you'll see momentarily, which includes the custom as well as complete, as well as bare or minimum package, which will come up momentarily. So this will extract the contents into a temp directory that are necessary for setting up the server. So this is the pop-up wizard typical Windows MSI installer and here we have the three classes of installation typical gives you the basic programs like the MySQL client utilities the MySQL server complete gives you everything else and custom allows you to select all some or none when you navigate to custom you see what's included in a complete installation it includes everything here, the server, the client programs, the instance manager, the documentation, and developer components. It's turned off by default. If you don't intend to use a server as a development server, then there are no, there's no need to install developer components. So the client programs include the MySQL command line shell. That's the MySQL client. Other command line utilities, server instance configuration, and then the instance manager which stands alone the server and its data files and documentation so let's go ahead and pick next for this custom which puts pretty much everything except developer components and notice the directory structure that will be used it's going to install the program in C program files MySQL server 5.1 as the version it also defaults to a similarly named directory under the C drive, C program data, MySQL, MySQL server 5.1. If you want to change where the program is installed, you can indicate here. And otherwise, if you want to change a data directory, you can do so after the program is installed by just modifying the data directory directive. So let's click on install to get the default instance going rather straightforward again this is the latest current community server that's available and it will register itself on TCP port 3306 just as it is done over on the next side and we'll have the utilities and those utilities client utilities will allow us to connect both to this local Windows instance as well as to remote Windows and or next base instances so we're not restricted, for example, to the just Windows servers when executing the Windows clients. So this is moving rather rapidly. We should be up momentarily with the server. Generally, Windows installations are straightforward. This talks about the subscription, which allows you to get updates and additional programs like the enterprise server, the monitor service, production support, the event that you need help, and it tells you what the Enterprise Monitor Service offers, the ability to fine-tune your server by monitoring its performance over time, checking its histograms, helping you to tweak, and so on. This option here registers the instance with Sun, which is now owned by Oracle, and the top option allows you to use the configuration wizard to configure the default settings such as the port, the password for the root account, etc. So we'll opt not to register since what we're doing is for demonstrative purposes, but for your environment, it would certainly behoove you to do so so that you can benefit from the updates, free offerings, and so on. So the configuration wizard came up and let's walk through it. 
Well, we have the option here to select either detailed or standard. If we proceed with detailed, which implies more advanced administrative capabilities and knowledge of MySQL, then we can tweak virtually every aspect of the server where standard generates a vanilla config file which works for most environments. Let's go with the detailed configuration. So now we need to determine whether or not the server is a developer machine which is used in a way that is shared which means MySQL should be cautious about the amount of memory that it allocates so that it doesn't clobber other applications. If it's a server machine or if it's a dedicated server machine. Now generally a server machine runs multiple services such as web server, domain control services like Active Directory, LDAP and others. In our case server machine makes sense because this server is running Active Directory. In your case you may for production and you should dedicate one or more servers to MySQL, in which case you'd select the last option. This area allows us to configure which of the storage engines are to be used as defaults. Multifunction databases will enable for transactional purposes in ODB just like on the next side and for general databases MyISAM with MyISAM being the default. If your server is to be a transactional DB server only, meaning transactional integrity is of the utmost importance, then use the transactional database option, which will configure InnoDB, enable MyISAM, but default to InnoDB for the storage of your databases as you define them. If you're storing non-transactional information, so simple tables, simple databases, then MyISAM will be activated, InnoDB will not be. Let's go with the multifunctional database, which allows us to alternate between MyISAM as well as InnoDB at will, which is the default configuration in the Nix environment. The InnoDB storage engine is always enabled. In fact, if we launch a PuTTY session quickly before we commit to this setting, and here we have a, an instance to our Red Hat box, we can connect there, then run the MySQL client utility has the wrong IP address so let's just update it to 111 from 11 so we'll click on new session this will bring the window up we'll load the profile for Linux CBT serve 1 and update the IP address to be 111 then save the changes and reconnect this will prompt us to accept the key because it's the first time it's connecting to 111 we'll log in as the user let's go with root in the event that Linux CBT is restricted based on our studies of SFTP and this will come back momentarily with the password. And then once we've authenticated, we'll run the MySQL client against our MySQL server running on the SUSE box. So now that we're here, let's connect using the user root, which is the default, so prompt for password and execute the following show engines against the host, the SUSE enterprise box. So this will attempt to connect to that remote system. Let's see if we're able to authenticate. And it doesn't let us connect. Let's double check our setting here. Let's see if Nmap can tell us whether or not the port is open. 3306 on the following hosts. And this will tell us momentarily if it's open. If it's not, perhaps the service is disabled. Usually by now it would have come back with a positive result regarding whether or not the service is running. And it sees it as closed. Let's SSH into it to rectify the matter. This will take a few seconds to come back as well. And that's why the MySQL client utility failed to connect because the service isn't running. The server is certainly up. It responded. There we are. We're logged in using PKI. Let's RC MySQL status to see what's going on. And the reason why we can't connect, because of where we left off, 3306 is now available only on the loopback adapter. So let's modify, rather than setting up an SSH, SSH tunnel, 
the my.cnf config file and we'll find where we've indicated bind we'll comment it out or we could specify an IP address but this will ensure that it binds to all IP addresses and then we'll RC MySQL restart and then rerun our netstat ntlp grep 3306 and now it's on all IP addresses so this means the MySQL client will be able to connect so let's exit and try that again from the Red Hat box and now it prompts let's supply the password this is going to be for the account that is allowed to connect across the wire which is root at percent versus root at one of the other defined hosts so this is what we wanted to look at let's take a look at the engines that are supported notice that in this case where it's a multifunctional database MyISAM is the default but InnoDB is also supported so it's enabled memory based tables are also supported but the transactional InnoDB is turned on and that's akin to what we're currently configuring so let's go back to the configuration wizard so multifunctional InnoDB storage engine and the my ISAM storage engines will be supported just like the default configuration on the NIC side now in terms of where InnoDB is allowed to store its data that's very important if you're going to be supporting transactional databases you should dedicate them as you would with any other DBMS to some other drive perhaps to a rated drive set so we shouldn't store the data tables for InnoDB on the same drive where the MySQL service is installed since we have two drives C and D let's just confirm that by clicking on computer let's bring this back in we've got C where the MySQL service is installed and D so we should install our data on D perhaps in a directory named MySQL or MySQL data for example so sticking with the Linux tradition if we confirm on the Linux side our data directory is var lib mysql and this is on the Red Hat box which is why it doesn't come up so let's connect this way to the remote system and then confirm that and we'll just stick with the same name so that as we work between platforms it's transferable and an LSL var lib MySQL so if we store our information in D MySQL or D var lib MySQL then it'll match up nicely so let's just double check our directory it's there D MySQL back to the installation wizard select the D drive it defaults to MySQL data files we'll change it to somewhere else but this is entirely optional and you don't necessarily have to peg your Windows installation to the Linux world but it just makes things more transferable and even more so if you use the full path var lib mysql so in this area we get to tweak the option concerning the number of simultaneous connections so we need to decide how the server will be used. Some database servers are used for online analytical processing by a handful of analysts. In that case, it's a decision support system, DSS. And in that case, there are fewer concurrent connections. However, OLTP or online transaction processing is designed for high volume transactions such as e-commerce websites or more precisely if you have a sense as to the number of concurrent connections your server will support you can indicate it here now it isn't a hard limit but the server will tune its memory memory and CPU resources resources accordingly so let's suppose this will be a heavily loaded e-commerce website so we'll go with the OLTP now we get to specify which port is used and here are some suggestions but the field is free so we could type in anything we want however we'll default to 3306 
since that's the default port. We'll stick with the default enabling of strict mode, which, in, which tightens the security. Now, nowadays, we have to be concerned about multilingualism, so it's best if you use UTF-8, which of course requires more storage than other character sets like Latin 1. So depending on your user community, will determine whether or not you stick to Latin 1, which covers English and Western European languages, or UTF-8, which covers all languages. So we'll go with multilingual support. But all the options are available in the drop list, including UTF-8 at the bottom, and the various character sets that apply to the world's languages like Cyrillic, etc. So we'll go with multilingualism UTF-8, which covers all of the world's languages. Of course we want MySQL to be installed as a service. This will be its name, and it will be set to start automatically. These are suggested server names, service names. In the event that you're going to mul manage multiple instances, then they'll ultimately have distinct names. And this last option allows us to be able to quickly reference the MySQL server binary as well as the client binaries from the path. So when we open a DOS window and type MySQL with tab completion, which is included in DOS window support within Windows 2008, then these utilities will come up just as they do in a Nix-based world. Let's define the root password for connecting. And this checkbox should be now familiar to you, enable root access from remote machine. This is a way of wildcarding the root account, so root at percent. If you'd like to allow anonymous access, which is generally not suggested, check the other box, but we'll skip it. So now we see a synopsis of what will occur. The configuration will be prepared, written, the service will be started, security settings will be applied, which basically means the grant table options, which disables anonymous access, sets a password for the user root, and ensures that root can connect from any system. So let's click on ex execute. This will execute those steps. Notice the default config file is my.ini as opposed to my.cnf. So that is the file that we'll consult in the Windows world if we want to make changes manually. But the configuration wizard you should know is available post installation so that you can tweak your server. And configuration file has been created, the service has been installed, it has been started, the grant tables have been properly administered, and now we'll, we can confirm using control panel services or from the DOS box services.msc either or. So let's just pull a DOS box up so that we can confirm the utilities are available as well and check the network port. So let's launch services.msc. This will prompt us as it is a reference directly to the management console for services. We'll see MySQL on the list momentarily. Let's scroll down and it'll be named the way we instructed the configuration wizard to label it. So this is the service. It's set to automatic. It starts when the system is started. The executable that's called is the MySQL D program with the following options. And as you scroll to the right, you see what those options are. It calls the my.ini file as opposed to my.cnf. It logs on and it runs. It logs in using the system account, but it runs using the MySQL account and or by default it's using the system account but we could tell it to use the MySQL account to ensure that there are no issues and perhaps some of the issues have been rectified concerning the administrative user account that it runs as but that remains to be seen and recovery in the event that it fails it has the default or uses the default options to take no action and then from the shell if we were to type let's say MySQL Notice it's in the path. It throws an error, which is good. And then an etstat AMP TCP will reveal that it's listening to 3306. So that's great. So everything's in place. So what we'll do next is explore 
the environment as it runs on Windows.